Magnuson, I apologize. I usually do this before we get started, but anything you want to say um, regarding the pre-sentence report? I know that it was just submitted um, about a week ago, um, but any updates that you have for, for me regarding this case? Thank you. All right, I'd like to thank everybody for being here and um, for the folks that spoke um, on behalf of the, the family here in this case. Um, as I said when I started um, talking to you today, that I am a district court judge here in Hennepin County. The reason that I repeat that is because I want you to know what that means. And what that means is being a district court judge in Hennepin County and in any county, as that I am not a rubber stamp for any negotiation between any parties, nor am I a hammer to bluntly meet out justice on behalf of any family, any victims, any community outrage that there may be. It is my job to objectively apply the facts of any given case to the law that I, um, that I have, that I am presented with, and make a decision based on the law and the facts that are here uh, in front of me. There's been a lot said today about the evidence that uh, <coughs> has been reviewed by probation, by the courts, um, by everyone else as we go through this process. I can assure you that my review of the evidence included the appellate record, treatment records, pre-sentence report, complaint, statements from individuals, emails, transcripts of um, statements made by um, Mr. Braveheart, Mr. Oseman, Mr. Braveheart's mother in the juvenile proceedings, expert reports written by Dr. Garrity, both for the um, juvenile case and a subsequent one that was done for this case. Um, also, the treatment summaries in this case the memos that were written by the parties and various studies, some of which I'm already familiar with um, relating to brain development. For those of you who don't know me and didn't take five seconds to Google me before these proceedings began, um, I don't like to spend a lot of time talking at uh, the sentencing hearings, but this one certainly requires more uh, detail and more information. So, prior to becoming a lawyer, I was a probation officer for 10 years. And what that means is that I spent a lot of time reviewing the same kind of documents that are presented in this case, supervising individuals in the community who have been placed on probation, writing pre-sentence reports myself. My career as a lawyer included representing the State Department of Human Services and the mental health facilities, which also involved reviewing treatment summaries, staff reports, discharge summaries, treatment records. Before I was appointed as a judge, I was a prosecutor in the Hennepin County Attorney's Office in the Adult Prosecution Division, dealing with cases like this. I don't tell you that because I want to make this case about me. I tell you that because I want you to understand that when I review cases, I bring all of that with me, which includes um, the knowledge of what information is contained in these reports and how important it is to read the entire reports and all the documents that are included. It also means that over the years I have already been exposed to a number of um, the theories regarding uh, brain development and how it affects juveniles as well as adults who are in the criminal justice system. 
I will tell you that our system favors negotiations. There is no way that we could do all the work that we do in Hennepin County or anywhere else in this court system without negotiated sentences. We need negotiated sentences for the system to work. And I know we've all, lawyers, judges, have sometimes had to hold our nose at some of the negotiations that, that we've had for the benefit of the system to get things moving. But those negotiations also follow the law. In this case, as you've heard the negotiation um, that is being proposed, the presumptive sentence here is a 261-month commitment to the Commissioner of Corrections. The negotiation would call for, rather than that sentence be served in custody, that the defendant be placed on probation for a period of five years with that time, as we say, hanging over his head as incentive for him to follow through with any treatment that we uh, want him to do. As most of you know, that sentence that is proposed in the negotiation and has been discussed here today is and would be a dispositional departure. In order for me to depart, I need to find substantial and compelling reasons to do that. That's why the case is here in front of me and not simply there being a plea and sentencing to the sentence that is recommended by the guidelines. The parties have submitted their negotiation and based the grounds for their departure on primarily three things. One, the uh, defendant's lesser role in this offense, the extensive rehabilitation interventions that he's had in the time that uh, he has been in custody, and the fact that the, defend the defendant is amenable to probation. Those are the arguments that I need to review in order to determine whether or not um, there are substantial and compelling reasons for, um, for departure in this case. In reviewing the record that is before me that I have already discussed, um, I cannot find that there are substantial and compelling reasons to depart. First, I do not believe that the record supports the party's assertions that the defendant had a significantly lesser role in this offense. People have discussed some of this already. However, I feel that as part of the record that I need to make, I need to discuss some of this further. Although the defendant ultimately did confess to the crime, It is not the case that the defendant has always cooperated with law enforcement. A review of the transcript of his statement would indicate that, although I don't know what period of time it was, that when the defendant was initially confronted with this offense that he um, blamed all the offense on Mr. Oseman that he denied um, wanting to participate, that he even denied shooting a gun and in fact said that he was walking away when he heard the, um, the gunshot happen. It wasn't until later in the, inf in the investigation and in speaking with the investigators that he finally admitted to his role in the offense, and that is that it was a joint decision to commit a robbery that day, and it was a joint decision once they saw Mr. Markey to approach the vehicle, guns drawn, bandanas pulled up um, to engage in this behavior. Although it may be true that Mr. Uh, Osman's gunshot was the 
final one that, um, that killed Mr. Markey in this case, both um, the evidence and um, Mr. Braveheart's comments were that he also shot at the vehicle as it was leaving the scene. The defendant also left the scene with his co-defendant. They retrieved the backpack that Mr. Uh, Mr. Braveheart admits belonged to him. <coughs> Mr. Braveheart admitted that the guns that were used belonged to him. They fled the scene. They committed additional offenses, some of which were offenses where um, the co-defendant remained in the vehicle or acted as the lookout when Mr. Braveheart committed the offenses. He fled with his co-defendant in the vehicle until they were subsequently apprehended. At no time during the course of what was going on on this day did Mr. Braveheart either uh, abandon the crime spree or abandon his co-defendant. The parties in this case and the experts and some of the other information contained in the reports um, opine that Mr. Braveheart's only reason for committing these particular offenses was to gain money to purchase food because of um, the situation that he was in. However, the record also indicates that Mr. Braveheart told Law, law enforcement that he purchased the guns for about $250. Would also note that none of the offenses that I'm aware of that he's been charged with and that bring us here today involved any actual attempts to steal food or anything um, that would help him in that endeavor. The parties also place a great deal of significance on the fact that the co-defendant fired the fatal shot. As we discussed, while it's true that the defendant did not fire the, um, the fatal shot, it is also true that the defendant fired at the vehicle as it was leaving the area. Given the time of day that this occurred, that action, in the court's opinion, made this offense more serious than maybe other carjackings given that the defendant shot. It was approximately 5 o'clock p.m. in the city of Minneapolis. That was more of a danger to the general public than perhaps other offenses where a gun was wielded and um, the person gave up the vehicle. From my read of the reports that have been submitted, the uh, expert reports and the arguments, it appears to me that the parties are both asking me to consider that Mr. Braveheart, because of his development, is both too young uh, to the point that he makes impulsive decisions, um, that he has no control and that he follows under other individuals, while at the same time asking me to give him credit for making what appears to be, in his mind, an extremely rational decision to only fire at the vehicle to disable it or whatever it is that he claims. The two of those can't exist in the same space. As was as far as his age goes as ter in terms of being a mitigating factor. This was uh, said by one of the family members as well. That not everyone who's had a similar background as Mr. Braveheart resorts to the level of violence involved in this offense and other actions that occurred on that particular day. <coughs> I would also note 
that the record does not support a departure on the grounds of his extensive programming. I don't want to rehash everything that already went up to the Supreme Court and was part of the juvenile uh, proceedings, except to note how it might inform my view on whether or not I um, consider that he is particularly amenable to probation based on his involvement in the treatment that he's engaged in in the last, uh, I think as defense says, and I think in the state's memo, four and a half or four years since he has been in custody. From what I can glean, it does indicate that it was Mr. Braveheart's decision to engage in the treatment that he is engaged in. I would note that one of the um, comments from his treatment provider uh, indicates that uh, Mr. Braveheart did opine, at least at one point, that he was thinking about the positive outcome that his completion of these programs could have on his case. What my consideration on whether or not he's particularly amenable to probation is, is not just about what Mr. Braveheart needs, but what Mr. Braveheart is willing to do. In reviewing the um, discharge summaries this case, in this case, as well as the um, factual basis for some of the discharge summaries, I would note, um, as the, uh, frankly, as the state had previously argued, that one arguably positive experience in treatment or in programming does not necessarily outweigh a lengthy history of program failures. Mr. Braveheart did agree to go to Red Wing while he was in custody. And he is to be applauded for the efforts that he made there, as well as getting his GED um, and um, being involved in, in both places in individualized treatment and the trauma-informed treatment. But rather than what has been described here as him wholly embracing um, treatment, being deeply and meaningfully engaged in treatment, fully availing himself of the treatment that was provided, the records note, um, progress that was punctuated by outbursts, disrespect to staff and other residents, episodes of physical violence, harassment to staff and other residents. In fact, the records indicate that his discharge and transfer to West Central were delayed uh, from Red Wing based on actions that occurred before he left the facility that would delay his entry into West Central. As far as his involvement with West Central, he went to West Central in November of 2021. The um, discharge summary from West Central indicates that um, in January of 2022, there were at least three major infractions that occurred, including threats to staff, uh, fighting with another peer, stomping on a staff member's foot, and attempting to trip another resident and then stating that nothing happened when confronted about this, even though this was observed on security cameras by other staff members. It appears from the discharge summary that at least the last um, part of his stay at West Central were without any major incidents that they were concerned about. However, uh, if we take that to be true, then what I'm looking at and what I'm considering to determine whether it is particularly amenable to probation 
is not a four to four and a half period of a track record of uh, solid uh, treatment. It's a four month period where he has only had um, what may be described as minor infractions. What I need determine to determine is not whether he is amenable to probation and whether he needs treatment, but whether he is particularly amenable to probation. And that is that it's above and beyond what the average person who might be placed on or that we might be considering um, for a departure here. With the record that I have in front of me, based on um, the findings of the treatment officials, his involvement in this particular offense on that particular day, and the actions that were taken by Mr. Braveheart on that day, I cannot find that he is particularly amenable to probation. And therefore, based on my review of the record, uh, I am not accepting Mr. Braveheart's guilty plea at this time. With that, um, Ms. Bailey, how would you like to proceed? that's available at this point is a, another omnibus and 